Good morning. I'm Dave. Dave Dorse, the pastor here, and wonderful to see all of you. I don't know about you, but if you were here last week, I that lasted all week, and I'm still pretty ex- riding high from the building dedication, luncheon, the ribbon cutting, everything. I think we figured out how many people we can cram in here for a luncheon, too. That was... Uh, that was a good experiment, and we had a lot of friends from early in the church's existence, and uh, new and old friends, some visitors even. It was great. So, go Eagles. I'm on that bandwagon too. Come on. But uh, we are preaching through Paul's letter to the Philippians. So if you would turn there with me in the New Testament. You get past the Gospels, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So we are chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 12 through 20. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the Gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, indeed, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Hebrews 4 12 reminds us that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, Your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word this morning to better understand it to conform our lives to what we've understood in the great redeeming delivering name of Jesus we pray amen letters from missionaries help their supporters know what's happening in their lives in their ministries i don't know about you you, you probably get some updates if you support missionaries. Uh, I get several of them. Let me share some quick updates with you. Uh, many of you know uh, a couple, Jim and Karen. Uh, from He was a pastor in this area. They are now missionaries in West Africa, where he is the regional director for a group that works for Muslim missions. Uh, they have recently transitioned from one church plant to another. They've helped start an RUF campus ministry, and they run the Timothy House, which is a two-year church planting uh, program, training program that just graduated its first class of church planters. Uh, Jim and Karen's daughter is getting married in June, and they are very encouraged in every area of ministry, but they pray that more teaching elders would join them, even on Zoom, to train local pastors. Scott Dillon has moved his family and ministry from Peru to Panama, uh, where they are adjusting to a new lifestyle, different lifestyle, different uh, economy. Their church, Comunidad de Cristo, Christ's community, right, is growing with a steady stream of new visitors, and they are looking for bigger space to rent. 
They are one of only a handful of Reformed Protestant churches in a country that has over four and a half million people. So they are hoping that the years ahead will see church planting in a Presbyterian denomination in Panama. The Dillons are homeschooling their kids and hoping to get visas for their adopted children so they can come to the States, and that may take up to another year. Satoshi and Callie are missionary couple who are in western France. They used to be in eastern Canada. They've uh, transitioned a few years ago. Uh, they are training and doing what they can to work with refugees, particularly the Muslim population there. Their daughters are studying in American medical schools, and they ask for prayers for their work and their family. Reformed University Fellowship at Delaware State is going very well. Daryl Watley, who was here last week for our celebration, uh, reports that he feels that God has put the fellowship back into Reformed University Fellowship after a couple of tough years of uh, lockdowns and just safety. Uh, so their worship services, their small groups, their social outings have gone well, and they had the, their fall retreat for the first time in three years. So celebrate with them. It's good to hear, to get updates uh, from our missionaries and parachurch leaders because we pray for them. We financially support them, but we very rarely know what's going on uh, unless we can visit them, see for ourselves, or they let us know. It's easier than ever, obviously, today to get updates. We can get uh, social media, text, Zoom calls, website updates, emails. Back in the Apostle Paul's day, though for a church to be updated on how a missionary, evangelist, or church planter was doing, he needed to send a letter, or a trusted messenger, or both. And we'll see in chapter 3 that the Philippians had sent a man named Epaphroditus to Paul, and now he was sending them back with update letter in hand. And Paul needed to update the congregation to let them know what was going on. They may have heard all kinds of rumors, been distressed that Paul had been arrested, so it was important for him to give them a report of how he saw what was happening to him and how he interpreted it. And his words in these verses make it clear that with everything happening in his life, he still saw his mission the spread of the gospel continued to advance. The Lord was still working, not only despite his confinement, but amazingly because of it. Paul reported that God was working through other believers who loved him, and even through some who resented him. As we read through, we study these verses, we'll see that if we are living for Jesus Christ and his kingdom and glory, all we have is Christ, our sure and steady anchor, to jam a few of our songs together. We can rejoice no matter what happens. Difficult circumstances, difficult people, even staring death in the face, can be sources of joy and eager expectation. So as Paul updated the Philippians, as he told them how he was doing, he didn't focus necessarily on all the aspects of his physical condition, but on the condition of his ministry, of his mission. So in the first three verses, he informed them that my imprisonment advances the gospel. That's our first point today. Verses 12 through 14, my imprisonment advances the gospel. Let me read that again. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. One commentary that I read titled this section, Prison is Great, Wish You Were Here. I don't know if Paul was going that far, but he certainly found a way to make the most of his trials, of his chains. He had not 
been imprisoned for any wrongdoing, right? But for his faith. According to verse 13, this was starting to become known, common knowledge, even the guards. And everyone who was around him in his imprisonment came to understand that he was there for his commitment to Jesus. Now in our minds, we think, oh, of course Paul was in prison for godly reasons, right? He was a martyr. He was persecuted for righteousness. We get it. We've read it. But that was probably not crystal clear to the believers in other towns, other countries, right? People often draw their own conclusions about what has happened, what they've heard. It would have been easy for the Philippians and others to think that Paul had broken the law or had left the faith, or that for some reason God was punishing him. Until people saw or heard from him, there was probably a lot of confusion. But lo and behold, instead of the confinement hurting Paul's ministry, he felt that it had actually served a great purpose, advancing the gospel. Now think about when Paul went to an area he was used to having to seek out people to tell about Jesus, whether that was in the synagogue or the marketplace or just people uh, in someone's home, on the streets. Now he had unbelievers literally chained to him. He was their captive, but they were his captive audience. Right? Imperial guards were rotated every few hours to be chained to this dangerous criminal whose only crime was sharing the message and love of a crucified Savior that had changed his life. These guards were probably used to the people that were chained to them, the the prisoners, full of anger, resentment, spewing angry words at them. Imagine how different it must have been when their prisoner was full of joy, probably took an interest in them, and then shared with them how they could have their sins forgiven and gain eternal life. Paul will mention later in the letter that there were saints in Caesar's household. His faithfulness in the midst of his trials saw not only guards, but family members of the emperor come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now obviously, those who had imprisoned Paul assumed that that would have a deterring effect on all the other believers, right? It would spread fear, make everyone too afraid to share their faith. Shut it down. That's that's the hope of every government that cracks down on a religion. But verse 14 says that the opposite happened. They grew in boldness and confidence. This is a little different when... Jesus was arrested and all the apostles scattered and ran away in fear, right? It's a lot more like what happened in 1956 as a team of missionaries led by Jim Elliott and Nate Saint were slaughtered by the tribe of Aka uh, natives in Ecuador. If you don't know that story, you need to look up uh, the book or the movie Through Gates of Splendor. It's a wonderful story. But this team of missionary who were killed by a native tribe in Africa became a very big deal at the time. It was covered in Life magazine. Everyone was talking about it. But rather than Christians back home being intimidated to go on foreign missions because of that tragedy and, and everybody backing away, there was actually a surge of Christian college students heading to the mission field. Not to mention that Jim Elliott's widow, Elizabeth, and Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, ended up going to the very tribe that had killed their husband and brother and lived among them, eventually seeing them come to faith in Christ. Paul's boldness and God's work through this persecution, emboldened the other believers into action. Now those believers that were fearlessly preaching the word were, Paul found out, were split into two groups. Friends and frenemies. Rivals. 
as Paul explains in the next few verses, that even my rivals advance the gospel. So we're going to read 15 through the beginning of 18. My rivals advance the gospel. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Reports had clearly reached Paul that while some people were preaching Christ out of good, godly motives, there were others who were preaching him from questionable motives. They were taking advantage of Paul being in prison and trying to elevate themselves and ruin his reputation. Now these weren't false teachers, not really like wolves in sheep clothing. They weren't unbelievers who were trying to wreck the church. Because if they had been preaching a false gospel, a different gospel, Paul would have rebuked them. They were Christians who loved Jesus, but had a blind spot when it came to Paul. They were jealous of all that he had accomplished. They wanted to make a name for themselves. You see a little bit of that in 1 Corinthians, where it talks about rival factions. Some followed Apollo, some followed Cephas, others followed Paul. But if they thought that they could show Paul up while he was in prison and make him feel bad, that they were winning spiritual glory while he was rotting away, they had forgotten that he already considered everything as lost. He considered himself a slave of Christ, and he wanted all glory to go to God. At the end of the day, Paul says essentially, oh well, so what? I'm not going to let them afflict me. I'm not going to let that bother me. I choose to rejoice. Now, I, I don't think that Paul was saying it's okay for believers who are engaged in evangelism and church planting to be selfish and nasty. But I think he is realistic that we're all a jumble of mixed motives and that good can come from anyone sharing the gospel. Paul chose to ignore the fact that they wanted to make him look bad as long as they were making Jesus look good. As Stephen Lawson put it, what really matters is not that Paul is exonerated, but that the name of Christ is exalted. Of course, he would prefer that people proclaim Christ out of love and see him as a legitimate church planter and preacher of the gospel, right? It's, it's much healthier for everyone involved and produces greater harmony in the Christian community when people preach Christ from goodwill, love, and truth. But the reality was that you can't always get that. And there was nothing Paul could do about it except pray and cheer that people were being saved. He was willing to be wronged and slandered because it wasn't all about him. Have you heard the word splant? It's a merger of the words split and plant. It's in, in church circles. It's when someone takes an existing church that wasn't necessarily looking to plant a new church and tears it, takes a certain group and takes a portion of the membership and goes and starts a new church. It wasn't the plan. It's, it's, and I'm not saying it's a great thing to do. If it's not done for good theological reason, I think it's very divisive. But at the point that the splant, this new church, is up and running, the old church needs to decide how it's going to act. They can resent and kind of bad mouth this new church is full of dissenters and schismatics, and, and there's probably some truth there. Or they can take the high road and say, well, at least we have a new church that preaches Jesus. Which would Paul do? 
Paul would say, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. In my experience, churches rarely act like that because we focus so much on our own kingdoms and not enough on His. This should remind us that anyone who believes and preaches the true gospel and believes that Jesus is the way to salvation is our partner and fellow laborer. And it doesn't matter quite so much if they do baptism a little differently than us. If they don't hold to all the points of theology that we do. If they speak in tongues or make prophecies that make us uncomfortable. They have big laser light shows. Not the orderly, dignified worship. We should rejoice that they win people to Christ and disciple them in God's ways. Our church and our denomination, even all the Protestant, uh, Reformed Protestant denominations put together can't reach everyone. So let's cheer on those who advance the cause of Christ, even if they disagree with us in many areas. Now, obviously, Paul rebuked people when they, he felt that they were preaching a different gospel, as I mentioned. And we should identify when churches or believers have crossed the line and changed the gospel to be something other than faith in Christ through grace alone. When they've abandoned the scriptures as their rule of faith and practice, they are not necessarily our partners and co-laborers. Pray for them. But when we cheer on other believers as partners in the gospel, there's no room for envy and rivalry. I love that our church is part of a bigger presbytery and denomination, and we can get so much more accomplished. I think I've been telling you guys, we are looking to plant churches in Milford and outside of Bethany. That's, that one's pretty new, actually. But even outside of our denomination, we can find partners in ministry. I just, you just have to look right next door, right? Lifehouse Church has its offices right there. And it would be easy for us to look at them and be a little envious and resentful. They have a lot more people than we do, and they have a bigger staff, and they got all this stuff going. And they could look at us and go, oh, they got their building already. We're still meeting in rented space. And, and we could just look at each other and envy, and, and we could, you know, subtly poison people towards the other church because we want you to come here, not there. We're not going to do that. We're going to speak well of each other. We're going to pray for each other and help each other. They let us use their front office for nursery. I've given them, you know, they, any meetings that they want to have here in the sanctuary, permission, come over. I've hung out with their pastors while we coached campers at the FCA camp. Let's find people on mission together. Paul's final piece of good news in this section is that my death will advance the gospel. So the last two and a half verses, starting at the end of verse 18. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. What do you have eager expectation about? Maybe you're looking forward to an upcoming vacation, a graduation, making the varsity team, getting married, having a baby, starting a new job, retiring. Those are all good things to look forward to. But as Stephen Curtis Chapman sang, there is more to this life. Paul uses a Greek word in verse 20 that some commentators think he made up. Apokorodokia. It does sound a little made up. But it, he uses it to express this idea of eager expectation, keen anticipation, intense hope. Literally, it means to stretch the neck forward. The only other place that he uses this word in the entire New Testament is Romans 8.19. For the creation waits with 
eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So what does Paul eagerly anticipate here? That whether he lived or died, that he would bring honor to Jesus. That he would not falter in the face of death and be ashamed, that he would face it with confidence and courage. He's not just resigned to his faith. He is stretching his neck, leaning forward, eagerly looking to what's coming next. Paul knew that it would only take one word from the emperor to end his life. And did he say, well, as long as I'm still alive, I'll bring glory to Jesus. No. He says that whether I live or die, Christ will be honored. Whether he would be sprung from his current imprisonment because of the prayers of the saints and the Spirit's help, or his life would end the next day or later, he would be delivered. If he was physically delivered, great. If he was killed, he would be spiritually delivered into glory. Now this is the beginning of a further section. We're going to talk a lot more about that as Paul dives deeper into the implications of whether it is better for him to live or die next week. So you've got to come back for that. So the question is, can we have that same assurance that we will be delivered no matter what comes in this life? Can we face death with full courage? We have an advocate, a mediator, a savior who conquered death on our behalf. So yes, we can. Jesus allowed himself to be arrested even though he had never committed a crime or even a single sin. His imprisonment was even more unjust than Paul's imprisonment was. Then he allowed himself to be hung on a Roman cross, the worst injustice ever committed. And he did it to save the worst kind of people. People who were by nature his enemies. People who are full of envy, rivalry, deceit, and impurity. People like you and me. He did it to represent us before God the Father, to pay the penalty for their sins in his body when he died. When we are saved in Jesus, his death makes our deliverance not only possible, but sure and certain. You want Paul's joy in the face of death? You need the hope of saving faith through Jesus inside of you. Now as we look at this passage and reflect on the fact that Paul, being on house arrest in a foreign country, limited mobility, limited access to people, to ways of ministry, if he could serve Jesus there, we have to believe that we can serve him anywhere we are, under any circumstance that we have. If you're sitting in math class, or if you're on a bus trip with friends or teammates, you can be a witness for Jesus. If you're at a job where you're forbidden to proselytize, you can still serve and model Jesus. If you're single, you can still serve Jesus. If you're divor divorced, widowed, whatever your circumstance. If you're pregnant, you can serve Jesus. If you're facing a stay in the hospital or upcoming surgery, you can either be angry or irritated that you have to go through that, or you can take the attitude, you know what, there must be some doctor or nurse or fellow patient that needs to see a Christian bear up through trials. Where we see restrictions, we need to see open doors that God gives us. Paul could have thought of his time under arrest as being sidelined for ministry, right? And said, oh, you know, don't worry, when I get out, I'll be back at it. 
I'll be back in full-on ministry. But no, he found the hidden ministry there. As I was thinking about this idea, I thought, well, you know, very few of I mean, I don't know all of you very well, but probably very few of us have ever been on house arrest, so I'm not going to use that. And then I remembered that the whole world was on house arrest three years ago. <laughs> right? For at least three months. We were all locked down. We were, uh, hopefully you weren't chained to someone, but it felt like it, didn't it? <laughs> And people use that time to get some much-needed rest and to learn how to work remotely and catch up on old hobbies, start new ones. You know. There was good that came out of it, bad that came out of it. But those who had Paul's perspective, who had kingdom eyes, found ways to use that time to reach out to help others, to minister in Jesus' name, to strengthen their families or the loved ones that they were locked down with. We can't rewind the clock and go back, but we can look for ways to redeem our trials and our limitations moving forward. Let me give you one example from my dad's life. Right there, I was going to... I'd have him come up and tell it, but as I told you last week, he's retired. I don't want to stress him out. And I've heard him tell it enough that I think I can do it justice. <laughs> when he was a youth pastor back in the 1970s, when I was a little kid, uh, he would take kids, teenagers, to camps and retreats. And the way that he related to the kids and thought the best strategy to gain credibility and minister to them was to play, dominate uh, basketball and tennis and all the other sports. I'm not judging, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and a little bit of that in my youth ministry days. But one summer, he had had back surgery, and the, the surgeon told him, you can't do any of that stuff, you got to sit, the most you can do is sit by the pool during free time. And so that's what he did, dipped his toes in the water, and just sat there. And he thought it would be such a waste that he would let the kids down and because he wasn't able to be in the middle of everything and running around with them. But lo and behold, as he sat by the pool, kids just came by one after another to talk, to, to share life. To, and he said he started counting and he got just under 50 kids coming by for very significant conversations. He said that six of the teenagers came to faith in Christ through those talks. What he thought would be a limitation turned out to be used for the advancement of the gospel. Where in your life do you feel like God can't use you because you're restricted? You've got problems. You've got something that keeps you from doing God's will. Well, Paul had his chains. What are the chains in your life that you think hinder you from being faithful to God because they may actually represent an opportunity. You'll have to look beyond your circumstances and see how God is using these setbacks and maybe even personal attacks for His glory. Now you may have to lay down your resentment of not being able to pursue all your own personal goals and dreams. Life is not going to go how you map it out. Paul probably wouldn't have chose prison, house arrest. And sometimes you'll have to take the high road and not worry about what others think of you and how they want to hurt your reputation. And you'll definitely have to look death square in the face and say, if I die, so be it. May God be glorified no matter what. Seek the first, the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the ministry of Paul. Thank you that we have his letters, his writings that were inspired, guided by the Holy Spirit. 
and yet contained his voice and his personality and his circumstances. And thank you that you had so changed him and so given him a passion for your glory and your kingdom through Christ. That he could take beatings, shipwrecks, being attacked from unbelievers, from the Jews, but even from inside the Christian community. And he could endure them. And he could endure being chained to Roman guards because he saw how you worked in every one of those areas. Lord, we are often so distressed when things don't go our way. We have our plans and our, well, how we think life should go. But wherever it takes us, whatever happens to us, Lord, may we look for where, how you are working. Help us to see that even locked down in pandemic, lying on a hospital bed, whatever our problems, Lord, there is a chance to honor and glorify you, to testify to your love and grace in our lives. We serve a crucified Savior. We are saved through him. Help us to cling to that salvation and share it and rejoice. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Receive the benediction from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Come as you are, grow in grace and knowledge, and go as Jesus said. Amen. Amen.